forward to the cloud. It looks like it's recording, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so as Abuna said, I'm going to cover um, the first epistle of St. Peter today um, as part of the series, and um, then uh, I think someone else is doing the second epistle uh, next week, if I'm not mistaken. Um, all right, so we'll go ahead and get started. So this first um, intro slide just has an icon um, that I really love uh, on the right there of Christ uh, walking on water and asking Peter if he wanted to do the same and um, kind of just gives us a little background on, on Peter and his experiences and um, his firsthand encounters with Christ and how um, that potentially shaped uh, his teaching his preaching and his writings. Um, go to the next slide, maybe, there we go. Um, so a little bit of backstory on, um, on St. Peter. Um, so as you may know, um, he was a fisherman by occupation. Um, he was the brother of St. Andrew. And at first they were both disciples of John the Baptist and they were later called to be disciples of Christ. Um, of course they abandoned everything and ended up following him. And when Christ asked the disciples what they thought of him in Matthew 16, Peter replied, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He was always very enthusiastic and very, you know, right there. And Jesus answered him, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And um, that surely, sure enough, ended up, ended up happening. Um, Peter was also at the transfiguration on Mount Tabor. Um, uh, and he was also at the scene of the resurrection of Jairus's daughter. Um, and finally, he was also at Christ's most agonizing moments at Gethsemane before the crucifixion. So he got to experience miracles. He got to um, experience walking on water. He experienced transfiguration. He experienced Christ's pain he, firsthand. He uh, visibly saw it. Um, and he was very explosive and very defensive when Jesus told his disciples that they would all abandon him. And he declared, as you recall, that he, he would never desert him. I will never, you know, I'll never leave you. But Jesus told him later that you're actually going to deny me three times. And sure enough, he did without realizing it. And once he was aware of it, he wept bitterly. Um, so he's a very interesting character. Um, he was restored after Christ's resurrection to his apostolic office, and on Pentecost, he was amazing. He preached to the multitude, um, converted 3,000 that came and believed, and he, you know, these 3,000 became sort of the nucleus of the first church of Jerusalem, and it was all because of St. Peter. Um, and afterwards, uh, he continued preaching and traveling fearlessly to many different parts of Asia Minor. And during the reign of King uh, Nero, uh, when all the persecution exploded, um, and then he was arrested and suffered a martyr's death, as we're aware. So that's just a little bit of background about the author um, of this particular epistle or letter that we're going to get into. Um, and then just a little bit of background on the epistle itself or the letter. Um, so if we look, um, it's unanimously agreed upon that St. Peter himself is the author. So there is some um, thought and, and thinking about some of the other epistles, St. Paul and such, that maybe he, they you know, he wasn't directly the author, but this one actually, I think it's unanimously agreed on that he himself was the author. And his style is really in harmony with the sermons that he gave that were recorded in the book of Acts um, around Pentecost. Uh, this epistle was written during, um, between the years 63 and 67 AD. So again, during the reign of Nero, during the persecution. And after he helped establish the church in Antioch, he preached to the Jews throughout Asia Minor. And later when he heard that the churches in Asia Minor, um, so we're talking about sort of this area here that you see on the map, when he heard that the churches there were being persecuted, um, he wrote them this letter of encouragement. And that's kind of uh, what the letter is really all about, um, is encouraging the churches and the Christians, the early Christians in Asia Minor because they were being persecuted. Um, and so if we look just kind of at a high level, the outline of the first epistle, um, so really the big thing is that he's writing to these early Christians who are suffering persecution, and he's telling them to remember to live in their baptism, and that the baptism is a death and a resurrection. Um, so you know when we baptize either infants or adults, you know, there's the three times where 
we say, you know, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the third time, the person, the baby or the adult, um, you know, is completely um, submerged underwater. So it's the death and then they come up and it's the resurrection. And Christians have to enter this um, unjust suffering, um, you know, with with spirit and anticipation of death and resurrection. So the, the whole point of the first epistle is really to remind these early Christians that ba being baptized into Christianity comes with suffering um, and without suffering and death, there is no resurrection. Um, and so this is kind of the reminder of that. Um, and he talks a lot about the fulfillment of baptism. And again, the end result, the end goal is heaven, is salvation. So we say at the end of the creed, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. Um, that's what we're all sort of headed towards. And that's what he's reminding everybody of. And so if you look at the, the epistle, there's, there's only five chapters. It's really short. Um, but he talks about in order for us to achieve our salvation for us to achieve the fulfillment of our baptism, that is death and resurrection. Um, we have to be committed or, you know, he's writing to the, the early Christians, but for us, we have to be committed um, to a few different things. And the first of which is holiness. And we'll go into some of these um, uh, a little bit later on. So commitment to holiness, a commitment to submission to the various roles in our lives, whether we're husbands or wives or priests or servants or teachers or masters, whatever we are, we have to submit to those different roles in our lives. Um, but also patient suffering in this age uh, in preparation for the age to come. And finally, he addresses unity in the church um, in the very last chapter. So we'll go through some of these. Um, and I tried to find kind of a common thread. Like I said, it's really hard to kind of put together a talk on an entire epistle. Um, so this is my first stab at it, but I tried to find a common thread. And to me, in reading this and reading, um, you know, additional sources, I found that I think the theme is really the challenges and benefits of salvation. Like it doesn't come easy. Um, and really, I think uh, on a more, uh, you know, if we drill down, it's really about how to be joyful or how to rejoice in suffering, which is kind of contradictory. Um, and so I'm going to kind of try to make the case that this is the main theme and try to build, um, you know, use some of the, the, the texts to, to support this particular sort of thesis, if you will. Um, and so just kind of keep this theme in mind as we go through um, and see if I actually, <laughs> uh, if it actually makes sense to you. Um, so the first thing that he opens with, which I, uh, there's a few like lines in there in the epistle that I really, really loved. And the first one is um, that he refers to Christians, the early Christians as pilgrims. The very first line in uh, chapter one, verse one, he addresses the epistles to, to the pilgrims, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Um, so he calls them pilgrims. And I found this very interesting because he did it again in chapter two, verse 11. He says, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. And this idea of a sojourner or a pilgrim, I thought was really interesting and kind of a good reminder that Christians are actually called to live as sort of sojourners, pilgrims, or aliens in some way, right? A pilgrim or a sojourner or an alien is someone in, who's in a strange place um, and who doesn't really stay um, for a long time. There's no intention of permanent residence there, right? Um, and it's kind of like we're on a layover, if you will, um, and we missed our flight or something. Um, so we're waiting for the next flight out. Um, and, it, and it reminded me also, you know, again, that we, we, we read in 1 John 2, 17, the world is passing away and, and its desires, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. So it's just a reminder um, that St. Paul starts out by saying, by the way, you are pilgrims, you are sojourners. This is a, you know, a strange place. This is not your permanent um, permanent destination. And so this pilgrimage um, is not based on our temporal life, but rather something much better. And it um, it really is telling about our belonging to the kingdom of, of the heavenly Christ, right? So in, um, we say in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, right? So the first sort of really 
interesting part that stuck out to me was this this concept of being pilgrims. Um, if we look, St. John Climacus actually also addresses this. Um, there's a quote from him. He says, being pilgrims means forsaking all temporal matters on earth, which hinder achieving our goal in the spiritual life. Pilgrimage is a humble behavior, hidden wisdom, knowledge about which most people do not know, hidden life, unseen goal, invisible meditation, longing for humility, desire for suffering, permanent determination on God's love, abundant blessings, rejecting vain glory, deep silence. Um, so again, being, being a pilgrim is not, uh, you know, someone who's always on the move or who doesn't have a permanent home, it's not easy. Um, and, and, you know, he highlights that being a pilgrim involves suffering and surely uh, St. Peter addresses that. And so the pilgrimage of suffering then is really carrying our human soul uh, with all of the energy that we have to get through all of these sufferings that are in this temporal life and all of the tribulations and all of the trials and all the things that we're struggling with for the love of the Holy Trinity. Like we re really, when you, you don't suffer for something unless you really love it, you know, whether you're a parent, whether you are someone who is courting someone, whether you are married, whether you have a really good friend, um, you don't suffer for someone unless you truly love them. And that's, that's what this pilgrimage is all about is really, you know, sort of carrying ourselves through all of this in order to express uh, and, and, and show our love of the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And St. Peter goes on in this epistle then to address how we maintain our identity and our status as these quote unquote exiles or pilgrims in the world. And in reading it, it really, what struck out, what struck me is that it really all centers around sacrifice. Um, sacrifice of my will and my ego, sacrifice of my humility, uh, a sacrifice of good deeds, sacrifice of my flesh and a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And um, if you look, um, Father Tedros Maliti uh, goes into a lot of detail on each one of these, and these are kind of his, um, his also uh, assessments of so the, the different sacrifices that we make as being pilgrims in this world. And so then all of these correspond to the spirit of the epistle, which is really directed towards suffering people. And that's what was happening to the people in Asia Minor, these early Christians, and he, St. Peter really had to you know, address this with them. Um, so one question that I had when going through this is, well, why does salvation even come with suffering? Like, why do we have to suffer? Uh, why does salvation, why is it coupled with suffering? And if we look in the text and we, and we dig a little deeper, salvation is invaluable, right? And it's uh, in chapter one, verses 18 and 19, St. Peter writes, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like gold or silver, but with precious, with the precious blood of Christ. Um, St. Athanasius on the Incarnation also addresses this. He says, through this union of the immortal Son of God with our human nature, all men were clothed with incorruption in the promise of the resurrection. So salvation is not something small. It's not, uh, it's something that is incorruptible. It is something that is so precious and so, uh, you know, you can't put a, a value on it. Um, it's, it, it, you know, if we look at Father Tedros Melati, he says, one pays silver or gold to free the captives of war. However, the Lord did not pay silver or, nor gold to redeem us from our aimless conduct, but he presented his precious blood, the sufferings which the Son of God has endured, and which led to the reproach of the cross. So gold or silver, these are just things that will eventually, you know, disintegrate. But and that's what you use to pay for a prisoner of war, but this is something so much more. So salvation, which has been granted to us, uh, has been granted by something so much more valuable, which is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so that's what makes, you know, salvation kind of worth it um, and why it's coupled with suffering. Salvation requires a brand new creation, right? So the only way for us to be saved was to be recreated, was to be reborn, to have this new birth through the baptism, which we put on, in which we put on Christ. Um, and I did a lot of digging trying to link this to the incarnation, just given the season that we're in. And there's a really, um, 
a really good analogy in there of, you know, when an artist uh, paints a portrait of someone and that portrait eventually, you know, gets stained, um, the only way to fix it really is to bring that person back and paint it again. And so that's essentially this, you know, new creation of salvation that Christ had to come and, and, and for us to actually be born again. And this new creation or this new birth, you know, with any new birth comes growing pains. If you think about it, just in the very literal sense, you know, a, a newborn baby um, in, in a way that we're not necessarily, you know, new newborns in like as humans, but we're newborns in, in our spiritual lives. And so all of that comes with growing pains. And all of that also comes with the responsibility as children of God. Um, so, and that's not easy. None of that is easy. And so that's why there is suffering, right? There's, there's pain and growing and learning and experiencing and falling and making mistakes and doing all of that. Um, by man, death has gained power over men, but by the word, man, by the word made man, death has been destroyed and life raised up anew. So again, it goes back to, um, if we look in chapter one, verse 23, St. Peter writes, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So again, this corruptible versus incorruptible, um, the incorruptible is, you know, the, the salvation um, that we receive. And um, that of course comes with suffering, unfortunately, but fortunately. Um, and so the reason that we can become like him, Christ, is because he became like us. Um, and that's, um, you know, we can become like him because he became like us. And that's, that's what the self, that's what, you know, is granted to us, uh, both in the, the birth, the death and the resurrection of Christ. And, and that's why really salvation comes with suffering. There's, there's a lot of work and there's a lot of, um, trials and tribulations that we have to go to, to get to, uh, where we are trying to go. Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> um, and so the, the salvation and the suffering, all of that, then, you know, in order to get to salvation, we have to share in the sufferings of Christ. Um, and I think that's, uh, there's sort of three things that I, I thought about. And, and first is, well, you know, why do I want to share in this suffering and what am I suffering for? And St. Peter talks a little bit about that. Um, and then the second, which we'll spend a lot of time on is how do we suffer? Because this letter is really talking about rejoicing in sufferings. And St. Peter kind of goes through a whole, a whole bunch of different um, ways that people suffer. And then the third um, sort of theme then is striving for salvation. So there's sort of three aspects of sharing in the sufferings of Christ. What, what are we suffering for? How do we suffer? And then the strive or the drive towards salvation. So what are we suffering for? So we talked a little bit about it earlier when we talked about it was for salvation. Um, but if we dig down a little bit into the epistle, then um, in chapter one, verse seven, um, through baptism, we are born into suffering and the resurrection of Christ. So the suffering is part of the testing of our faith. So if we look at chapter one, verse seven, um, St. Peter writes, in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, so it's the analogy of gold being put into the fire to become more pure. And that's what St. Peter is, is, is telling us and telling the early Christians is that um, gold that has become, um, that has been put in the fire becomes more pure, can withstand the test of trials in afflictions and grow in firmness and genuineness and purity. And so you know, one of the things we are suffering for then is to really test our faith and to become stronger and to become more pure. Um, the other thing we're suffering for, St. Peter writes about, is this inheritance. Again, it's this theme of this incorruptible. So he writes in verses three to five, an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 
So we're suffering to get this inheritance, um, not an inheritance as we would normally think of one, but an incorruptible inheritance that does not fade away, that is reserved for us in heaven. That's a wonderful thing. I'm glad it's reserved, but it's going to take some suffering, right? So I'm suffering to obtain the joy and the blessings of eternal life. And so again, he's reminding the people like there is more than just the trials and tribulations that you are going through, you know, keep your eye on the prize. And the suffering is unto glory and salvation. So in verse nine of chapter one, St. Peter writes, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So the salvation is a work in progress, right? Um, he talks about, uh, you know, it's about loving and trusting and rejoicing in Christ now, so that the end goal is this full and final salvation. All right, so that kind of, he's kind of explaining to them like, this is all really hard right now and you're suffering, but it's for a good reason. And there is much, much better prepared for you um, in the end. Um, he goes on and he, uh, he talks, so salvation comes when we allow Christ to work internally within us. So sowing love and confidence and joy that goes against the stream of secularism. So if we, you know, think about the analogy of the fish that swims upstream, you know, salvation comes to us when we allow Christ to work to help us to go against the stream of secular, secularism and godlessness and worldliness, which is basically all around us in society and has pretty much always been around. Um, St. Peter emphasizes that Christianity is first and foremost a matter of the heart. Um, and this is, this is really um, beautiful. He says, he continues in uh, chapter one, verse eight, when he's telling them, um, you know, that you are much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire. He says, uh, May it may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with, inex rejoice with joy, inexpressible, and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Um, so it has nothing to do with, you know, what we see or what we experience with our senses, but Christianity and salvation is only experienced through all the matters of the heart, right? Um, and this mystery of salvation, you know, that is awaiting us is was foretold by the prophets. And he talks about that in verses 10 to 12 of chapter one. And this mystery of salvation, you know, this incorruptible, beautiful place in heaven that is reserved for us is so great that even the angels, he says, would wish to know about it in detail, but do not. So it's this mystery um, that the prophets foretell and the angels know nothing about, but it's, but it's a wonderful a wonderful thing that awaits us. And so this is the kind of thing that gives us the hope of, you know, why am I suffering here? Why am I a pilgrim? Why am I an exile? Why am I an alien in this temporal place um, going through all of the things that I'm going through in the same way that these early Christians suffered as well? There's much more. Um, there's much more to look forward to. Um, so how do we suffer? Um, and we suffer in a lot of different ways, um, as did the early Christians. And I think the suffering happens uh, through submission and sacrifice. Uh, so if we go through now and we kind of look um, at the different kinds of suffering that the early Christians were experiencing, which we all experience today, um, one of the ways we suffer is, uh, he talks about in chapter two, verse 11, is uh, in abstaining from fleshly lusts. Um, he says, beloved, I beg you again, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when you speak against, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Um, abstaining from fleshly lusts is a struggle. It's a suffering, right? Being able to submit or redirect my senses and my passions to that which glorifies God is a struggle. It's a suffering because of everything that's around us that's telling us to do the opposite. Um, and so that sacrifice and that submission uh, is part of our suffering and is part of our journey. He also talks um, in chapter two, verse 13 about submitting to civil government. 
Um, so even that, uh, he says, therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king supreme or to the governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. He tells them, honor all people. Um, and so he talks here about, you know, submitting to the government and um, Tertullian um, also addresses this. He says, regarding proper honor for kings and emperors, it is very clear that we have to be in complete obedience as the apostle commanded us to be subject to rulers and authorities. However, there are limits to this obedience, which is to keep ourselves from worshiping idols. So, the, you know, some of us may feel like we are, you know, suffering <laughs> uh, with the, you know, for example, the current election, like, wow, this guy's got to be my president now, I'm not so happy, or, you know, the previous, you know, administration or whatever it is, but submitting to civil government is in some way a suffering and a submission because whoever's in charge, um, you know, we have to, St. Peter writes, we have to be, you know, subject to our rulers and to our authorities. Um, and the limit to that obedience, of course, then is to keep ourselves from worshiping idols. So if you remember, for example, King Nebuchadnezzar and the three holy youth, you know, that was the, that was the line that they wouldn't cross. And that's why they got thrown um, into the fire. And so, you know, then another sort of way to suffer is submitting to our civil governments. Um, he talks also, like I just read in verse 17 of chapter two, to honor everyone, honor all people. That is a, that is a struggle um, to honor everyone, no matter what. Uh, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. That, that's suffering, in my opinion. It's really hard to honor everyone. Um, it's really hard to, to find the good in everyone. It's really, you know, we all have, um, you know, the struggle to to make sure that we treat everyone well and and the reason that we need to honor everyone is because in spite of all the corruption that human nature has undergone the divine image is there in the deep deep parts of each human being and i think you know saint peter when he says honor everyone love the brotherhood it's really a call for us to suffer and submit and really sacrifice um and try to find uh the divine image in each and every human being um, so yeah, that's, that's a struggle. That's a suffering. Um, and he also then discusses submitting to masters, uh, in verse, uh, 18, he says, servants be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. So, um, you know, these can be servants to their masters. It could be employee to boss if we take it to modern day. Um, and he says, submit uh, to your master, not only the good one, gentle ones, but also the harsh ones, uh, for this is commendable. If because of conscience towards God, one endures grief and suffering wrongfully, for what credit is it if you, if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently, you deserved it, obviously, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Um, so he, you know, it's, it's a struggle for us to submit to masters, to bosses, to people who are not so kind to us, who are in charge of us. Um, and it's a suffering and St. Peter addresses that, uh, to, for us to be submissive, uh, and to suffer through that, uh, you know, because it is commendable before God, if we take it patiently. Um, and then he spends a lot of time talking about spouses submitting to each other. Um, he talks about wives um, submitting to their husbands, which, uh, you know, we hear a lot during the, the wedding ceremony. Uh, and, you know, people are always giggling um, wives to be submissive to their husbands. And um, he talks about obeying uh, as Sarah obeyed Abraham. Um, he also discusses uh, for women uh, their adornment, that it not be only on the outside, you know, taking care of our hair and wearing gold and putting on really nice clothes, um, but rather it's really what's inside of our hearts. Um, again, the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit he talks about. Um, and he talks about, you know, the different roles, um, not only for wives, but also for husbands. And he talks about that, you know, it's, it's reciprocal and there's a reciprocal faith. And when a woman um, or a wife um, is submissive, 
And, um, you know, she can be a really good example for her husband. So he addresses, uh, again, the role of wives and husbands, the reciprocal faith, the devotion to one another, the husband, you know, to give honor to the wife, to dwell with them with understanding, um, and to honor um, each other. And he talks about that in chapter three, verses one to seven. So, and this is a suffering, believe it or not, if you're married, you know, um, married life is not easy. Um, it's not easy to submit to one another. It's not easy to honor one another all the time. Um, you know, it might be nice in the first year or two, and then it gets hard. There's nothing easy about it. Um, and really, you know, maintaining that and continuing that is a suffering and it is a struggle. Um, not that marriage is suffering, but it's, it's all about submission and sacrifice. I can definitely say that. Um, and so St. Peter addresses that again. So there's all these different ways that we suffer, whether it's in the flesh or in submission to authorities or having to honor everyone, even if we don't necessarily like them very much, or our bosses or our spouses. Um, these are all different ways that we suffer. And clearly people in early Asia Minor, early Christians also suffered. So we're not alone. I mean, this has been going on for a long time. Um, and there's more. Um, in chapter three, verse eight, he talks about uh, the suffering that comes with submitting our pride and our desires. Um, he says, be of one mind, um, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. This is hard um, and this is suffering. Um, having compassion for one another, being of one mind, being tenderhearted, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, that takes, that's, that's a lot. That's really submitting my pride, my desire, my ego, you know, blessing someone who is reviling me, that's, that's pretty hard. That's a pretty tough, tough pill to swallow. Um, but again, St. Peter reminds us um, that this is part of the suffering that we need to go through in order for us to really show our love for the Trinity, in order for us to be renewed, live in our baptism, um, you know, remind ourselves of the salvation that we are suffering for. Um, in chapter three, verse 17, another way that we suffer is by having to submit to good conduct. It's hard to be good. Um, we're not only called, we're not only to be called Christians, but to be Christians. So there's two different things, right? I can call myself a Christian, but St. Paul or sorry, St. Peter is saying in chapter three, verse 17, um, he says, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than doing evil. So I can't just be a Christian by name. I have to be a Christian in, in my actions and, um, you know, to constantly strive to, to do the will of God and to suffer for that rather than to take the easy way out and, you know, not necessarily do evil, but not do good. Um, so submitting to, you know, making the decision to do what is right, which is never hard, it's hardly ever easy, um, is a type of suffering. Um, and then a really big one that he goes into in chapter four then is subduing our vices. We all have vices. You know, I, I get angry too quickly. I don't have patience. Um, I don't have self-control. I can't fast. I love to go out drinking. I, <laughs> whatever it may be, everyone has a vice um, or vices and subduing those and, and, you know, crucifying our passions, if you will, um, is, is really, really hard to do. And that's, that's, I think for me, one of the, the biggest ways that we all suffer. Um, St. Peter says, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. And chapter four, verse three, he says, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. And he goes on to list all of 
the vices, lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable, abominable idolatries. Um, so clearly the early Christians had a lot of issues with partying and drinking. Um, but, um, you know, these are, these are vices that they were dealing with, and we all have our own vices now. And so St. Peter, you know, is really encouraging them to avoid everything connected to our previous life. That's what baptism, again, this renewal, this new creation that comes with it, this responsibility, this submission, this suffering, um, you know, it's about abandoning all of, you know, these things that we have done in our past lifetime prior to our baptism, prior to our new life. Um, and again, subduing these is a type of suffering um, that we're all going through. Um, and then in chapter five, um, he talks a little bit about submitting to our elders and our overseers. Um, you know, suffering as, as a church, um, the elders, the people who are shepherding us, who are flocking, who are shepherding us as, as the flock of God, um, people who, you know, our servants, our priests, our bishops, all of the leaders, um, you know, submitting to them uh, is also a type of suffering. Because again, anytime I have to submit to someone and I have to, you know, turn away from what I want, um, you know, it's a type of suffering. He tells uh uh, the early Christians in verse five, likewise, you younger people submit yourself to your elders. Um, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So as a church, we all have to submit to each other, young, old, uh, you know, dressed in black or not dressed in black. We have to submit to one another, be submissive to one another and clothed with humility. And that's hard. Um, it's really hard for me to submit to, and to someone else um, in, in, uh, for anything. And that's in and of itself a, a suffering um, as a church together, as a community uh, to submit to one another. I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, oh, there's clearly a lot of suffering here. Um, in chapter five, verses six, six through eight, again, he kind of addresses submitting, submitting our will and our cares. Um, and this is a big one. Uh, he says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil walks about like a roaring lion. Um, so again, submitting my will, my desires, my cares um, to, to God's will and God's desire and God's cares and being sober and vigilant. This is really, really hard. And this is, um, you know, all of the trials that we endure um, have a way of threatening to break us, right? The things that we worry about all the time, we agonize about, we're sad about, we're worried about, we're fearful about, you know, a lot of times we become consumed. And I mean, look at the the time that we're in right now, a global pandemic, you know, everyone's worried what's going to happen next. Um, you know, the economy, my family, the sickness, we all haven't been at church together. I miss people, my children, my parents, they can't get sick. We're all consumed, right? And so, all the different trials have a way to sort of, they threaten to break us. And so I think St. Peter is really telling us and reminding us, and it's very relevant to today, is just humble yourself, um, that he may exalt you in due time, cast all your care upon him. Um, easier said than done, obviously. Uh, I can totally attest to that. Um, but I think we have to continually remind ourselves of, of this, you know, humble yourself, cast your care upon him and not to become consumed with all of the different trials that we are enduring. Um, there's a really good book I was gonna recommend for potential another book club. It's called Renewing You. Um, it's by a priest, uh, Reverend Dr. Nicholas Lowe and Dr. Roxanne, his wife, who is a psychiatrist or psychologist. Um, and it has a really good section on, you know, how to deal with trials and vices and tribulations. Um, and it goes through kind of a step-by-step -step of how to do that. I totally, totally recommend it. I'm still getting through it, but um, again, just a reminder of, you know, everybody's in the same boat, everybody's suffering, and we just have to throw our cares upon him. Um, this part about be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. Peter writes how important it is to watch over our own thoughts. 
Um, and our thoughts are sort of this uh, battlefield of spiritual warfare that exists in our mind. Um, and again, in the book that I just re referred to, Renewing You, it talks about this, how our thoughts are kind of the place where these things start. And this is the place where the devil starts. And um, he uses our reasoning and all the arguments that we make to ourselves about situations as sort of the the jumping off point or the platform to launch his attack. So he knows that we use reasoning and arguments and logic and the things that we try to convince ourselves of. And he uses that as sort of like, okay, I'm going to use this, your logic and your reasoning um, to start tripping away and attacking um, at us and making us feel you know, helpless and sad and depressed and alone. And that's sort of the, the tactic there. And so St. Paul, St. Peter is telling us be sober and be vigilant and sort of be in touch with our thoughts because that's where things are going to get started. And that's how it's sort of like a little termite. Um, I have termites in my house right now. So it just reminded me of that, but it's sort of like little termites that start to sort of chip away and eat away. And so we need to be sober and vigilant. And the devil, I mean, the way he works is he sort of explores each of us individually, right? And he's looking for the weak, the weak part. He's, you know, the, walking about like a roaring lion. He's the roaring lion is looking for the weakest animal to go after, right? He looks for, okay, who's my easy target? And that's kind of how the devil explores each of us. He looks for our weak spots, appeals to our senses, again, our reasoning, our arguments. And it's sort of really like tailored. He's a very smart guy. Um, and it's sort of specifically geared, geared towards what tempts us, right? So for even, even for Christ, when Christ fasted and went into the wilderness and he was tempted by the devil, the, the temptations were specifically geared towards Christ, right? Like he has, he was hungry. So he tempted him with bread. He was, you know, he tempted him with power. He tempted him, um, you know, with pride. And so it's specifically geared towards each and every one of us and what is going to get us. And when he's unable to tempt us, then he brings, you know, forth this threat of persecution, you know, a threat of suffering so that that fear causes us to betray our faith. And so again, as St. Peter writes, we have to be alert for these sort of multifaceted attacks and ready to resist at every single turn because he's like a roaring lion is gonna be looking for that, the weak link, the weak spot. Um, so this is all part of our suffering. Um, it's, it's pretty hard um, being a Christian and looking towards the incorruptible um, and um, there's nothing easy about it. And I think St. Peter uh, addresses all of these and, and kind of really encourages and says, you know, be aware, be alert, uh, know that, you know, Christ has come and has suffered before you and there is something to look forward to and you're doing it for a reason. Um, and so the last part then is really about, you know, what are we, you know, what are we suffering for and how do we suffer? And it's really about, you know, striving towards salvation. So we talked a lot about the challenges of salvation. And so I think we're going to maybe go now into sort of the benefits. We talked about first, you know, being dedicated to holiness. We talked about suffering through submission and sacrifice. And then I want to talk just a little bit, um, you know, as we round out the epistle here, um, sort of things that are a little bit more positive and some other parts of the epistle that I didn't address that I'm saving for here that I, I really fell in love with. Um, the first, as we strive for salvation um, and we strive to obtain the benefits are, one is desiring the word and the second is becoming living stones. So there are two really important things I, and, and parts of the epistle I didn't cover. Um, so this first part about desiring the word, um, again, I found this verse to, it really hit home for me. Um, in chapter two, if we go back to verses one to three, St. Peter writes um, about desiring Christ. He says, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. This concept of a newborn baby desiring the pure milk of the word was just so beautiful <laughs> to me. And when you dig down a little bit and you think about it, um, newborn infants, that's all they drink. That's all they eat. It's the milk from the mother. Um, and so the analogy of a new birth after baptism falls right in line with that, right? As I'm an infant, I'm a spiritual infant, I'm at the beginning of my spiritual age, and I need the spiritual milk. 
And the pure milk of the word, you can say, that is the word with a capital W, the logos, Jesus Christ, and his pure instruction, right? And this is the instruction that we get, you know, from the church and from the life of Christ. Um, and St. Peter writes, let you have to lay aside evil, malice, envy. These are the things that hinder our spiritual growth. They sort of stunt our growth and they are not, and they cannot exist in this pure spiritual milk. I love this analogy a lot. And I don't know if it's because I'm a mom or what it is, but it's, it's just really beautiful. And it, and it sort of returns us all to this infant stage of, um, of our spiritual lives. And I think St. Peter really, really, you know, talks about it in this way because this is these are new Christians they are newly baptized um, and he's reminding them like you know as an infant craves milk we have to crave the milk of the word um, which is Jesus Christ um, Father Tadros Maliti writes the starting point is that the believer continuously realizes that he is a nursing baby um, I think that's really powerful if I just constantly remind myself like I'm just a baby in the faith I'm just a baby in my spiritual life um, It'll keep me coming back, uh, you know, to the church for the milk. It will keep me coming back to Jesus Christ for this pure spiritual milk. Um, and Father Tedros talks a little bit about, you know, the, the church providing that milk. Um, so does St. Clement of Alexandria. He says, it, or the church, is the milk of love. Blessed is he who nurses from it. Again, this analogy of, you know, being spiritual infants and nursing from the church, um, this pure milk. Um, this is the way that we grow in our spirituality and this is the way that we grow towards salvation and we experience the benefits of salvation. Um, the church offers us all of these different things, right? We have the rituals, we have fasting, we have, you know, prayers, we have teachings, we have, you know, being present in church, we have communion, we have intercessions of the saints, we have all of these different um, ways that we can partake and experience and taste of, of this milk. And these are, the, and you know, this is what is going to get us through all of the sufferings um, that St. Peter outlines and discusses is really just, again, going back continuously as a nursing baby and never feeling like I know enough, I've had enough. A nursing baby has never had enough. Um, you know, they always keep going back for more. They'll stay on as long as they possibly can. You know, if you're a mom, you know this. And and spiritually, we have to kind of do the same thing is just continuously come back and, and never, never be satiated and never, never feel like we've, we're full. Um, so then the question for us and, you know, the question that, you know, pops up from this is, do I long for the word? Do I long for this milk? Do I desire it? Um, so we shouldn't just settle or say, you know, I'm, you know what, I'm not going to change. This is just the way I am sort of this spiritual fatalism. Like I'm, you know, there's no, there's no way like this. I'm just too far away. Um, you know, I, I'm just, I'm rusty. I, you know, I'm, I'm going through a dry spell. Like we shouldn't settle for it. Right. We should, it's not what God wants for us. We just, that's again, kind of like the devil playing on our weakness and our logic and our, um, you know, making an argument and kind of just chipping away at our thoughts. Um, St. Augustine in his book, Confessions, he writes, O God that ever burnest and art never quenched, O charity, my God, enkindle me, right? So, um, you know, light this fire in me to desire, um, to desire you. Thou commandest continence, grant what thou commandest and command what thou wilt. So St. Augustine talks about sort of asking for God to help you know, kindle that desire for the word and kindle that desire for the pure milk um, as, as newborn infants. And so this, this idea of, you know, desiring the word is, is one of the ways that we help cope with the sufferings and find a way to, um, you know, fill ourselves with uh, this pure milk of the word of Jesus Christ uh, in our new birth, in our new baptism, that is sort of the precursor to um, our suffering and our eventual uh, resurrection and salvation. Um, the other really, uh, really neat uh, passage is, talks about Christ as the chief cornerstone, which we've heard, and talks about us uh, as becoming living stones. So in chapter two as well, uh, right after he talks about us being newborn babes, um, he says, uh, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 
Um, and then he says, therefore it is contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. And this is in um, chapter two, verse six. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about a cornerstone and a living stone and, and dive a little bit into that. And I think about when, when he says, behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone. Um, and we've heard this before a cornerstone, you know, when you think about it is the stone that forms the base of a corner of a building. Um, it's, it's kind of important. Um, it joins two walls, for example. Um, and Christ is, uh, you know, that's, 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 uh, it makes sense because Christ is that cornerstone or that intersection for us between heaven and earth, between mankind and God. He's sort of the intermediary. And so the entire spiritual building of the church is founded on Christ. Um, and then he says, um, therefore, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense in chapter two, verse seven. Um, and this is really referring to then that the Jews knew him and crucified him. Um, and, you know, the whole world, St. Augustine says, heard about him and believed in him. Um, so, you know, the, the stone which the builders rejected, Jesus Christ, has become the chief cornerstone. Um, and to those who don't believe, he is a stumbling block and a rock of offense. Um, but to those um, who believe, um, you know, he is, he is truly that, that intersection. He is truly that, that cornerstone. Um, and we will not be put to shame as it says in chapter two, verse six. Um, and this, this idea of, you know, he is the cornerstone, no matter what, uh, you know, there is nothing anybody can do about it. And human disbelief or unbelief doesn't frustrate or defeat the ultimate purpose of God, right? If God plans for Jesus to be the chief cornerstone, humans can betray him, desert him, deny him, mock him, strike him, spit on him, hit him with rods, crown him, strip him, crucify him, bury him, but they can't stop him from being what God destined him to be, which is that living cornerstone to a great nation, right? Which is, uh, you know, all of his followers. In chapter two, verses nine and 10, St. Peter writes to the early Christians, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, who had not obtained mercy, but now, but have now obtained mercy. So again, this is an encouragement to the early Christians who are suffering. You are chosen, right? So you are a holy nation, his special people, and you have mercy. So, you know, again, just sort of hang in there, right? Um, be that living stone. And so he's telling them and he's telling us we have to be these faithful living stones, no matter where we come from. Um, we are united in a common faith, right? Uh, all part of this one building uh, together, uh, the spiritual building. In spite of all of the sorrows, all of the trials, all the persecution, we will triumph and conquer because Christ is our chief cornerstone. He's sort of that supporting initial in the foundation. And that will cause all of our enemies and all of our trials and all of our suffering to be put to shame. And so as individuals, as families, as a church, as a nation, um, St. Peter tells us we should base our lives on this cornerstone in order for us to be victorious and triumph over all of our sufferings. Um, and um, I think in, in thinking about, you know, becoming these living stones, um, one of the ways that we can do that is to really just uh, going back to the beginning, reminding ourselves of our status as pilgrims. So it's really easy to get attached uh, to this life, to the things of this life, to the to the temporary things. And one of the ways that we can become these living stones is really to remind ourselves that we are pilgrims, we are sojourners, we are exiles, we are aliens, and to not get assimilated and not get caught up in this. And this is, I, I really wanted to tie this to the current season and the current time of year. And uh, so forgive me if this is a stretch, but it's actually, you know, thinking about it, it's challenging to not get attached and not to assimilate especially during this time of year, if you think about this season, um, it's just laden with consumerism, right? Even before Christmas season begins, there's all the pre-holiday hysteria. I mean, you saw Christmas trees in Costco in like June, right? 
And all of this hysteria kind of conflicts with the, the nativity fast, which we are in the preparation for the birth of Christ, which we are you know, supposed to be doing. The fast gives us this possibility to prepare properly, right? Um, and in fact, fasting during this time, which unfortunately the season has become secularized, fasting during this time when, when this, this has happened kind of really hones in on what is our position and asks us the question, who or what are we with? Am I with, um, you know, the sales and the deals? Am I with Santa Claus, New Year's Eve celebrations, fireworks, you know, the whole world? Or am I with myself and with my soul in another place. I think having the fast during this time kind of helps us focus a little bit on, you know, where, where am I? Like what's, what's important right now um, during this season. And I, this is all temporal. I think that's, that's, you know, one of the things for us to focus on during the fast is renewing, if you will, our pilgrimhood. I don't even think that's a word, but renewing that, um, you know, reminder that we are pilgrims and not to get caught up in all of this hysteria. Um, and really, you know, using the fast as a time for us to think about who, who or what am I with? Um, what, what am I doing? And if we reflect on it, it turns out we're not at all in this world to celebrate with everyone else, right? We're, we're, we're in this world to, to do something more and to achieve something more that is incorruptible um, and that is reserved for us in heaven. Um, so as modern Christians, this time of the fast is really just a little opportunity for us to have a personal confession before God. It allows us to see how much, how much within me is secular and how much am I, you know, strapped to my passions and the things that I want and the things that I need. And it also kind of gives me an opportunity to sort of recalibrate and remind myself that we are all actually indeed pilgrims. Um, so I, I guess the challenge then is to use this fast as a way to sort of renew our pilgrimhood that St. Peter talks about um, and to renew our, our focus and to, you know, suffer. It's not easy to be fasting during this time when everyone is eating and drinking and being merry and, um, you know, to, to, to focus on, you know, on on what, what am I preparing for? And so, um, you know, the challenge then to return to and to renew our, our pilgrimhood, um, I think is, is one of the things that I took away from, from trying to tie this into where we are um, seasonally in the church. And so then to kind of wrap things up, um, I had a, a few kind of, um, you know, conclusions that I came up with. And, and that is that then, again, I'm going to tie it into the nativity because this is, I, I, I'd like to tie it in seasonally to where we are, but the nativity should remind us that God, the son, Jesus Christ, in all of his holiness and his purity has, and his power has restored to us what was lost. And that's the presence of God in our lives, right? And that is the reminder of our baptism, our new life, um, and what we are, what we are headed towards. And um, the nativity also reminds us that death is overcome, the temporal and the eternal, and that our corruptible lives, like St. Peter talked about throughout his epistle, are made incorruptible um, through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Um, you know, before we were lost in all of our revelries and all of our past, you know, habits that, um, you know, St. Peter talks to the early Christians about, um, it's this empty, you know, past human existence and it's no more. So the nativity reminds us of rebirth and a new creation, um, you know, that has come to, to, um, allow us to become these nursing infants again and give us opportunity to drink of the pure milk of the word. And our salvation is our new existence. So again, this the theme of this transformation that begins with the new birth through our baptism. And then to achieve our salvation then is to enter into this new, new reality where there are challenges and suffering, right? So um, it's not it's, none of it is, is easy, but I think the nativity reminds us then um, that with this new birth and this new life, um, it's not easy, but it gives us an opportunity to overcome our challenges and our sufferings. And St. Peter um, addresses each and every one of those in his epistle. And if we live in his promises, and St. Peter talks about this too, then we can endure and we can be victorious ultimately. Um, um, in all of our sufferings. And so I think it, you know, takes us to 
um, you know, again, that theme of like, there, are, there is definitely benefits um, to salvation and there are challenges to salvation. And um, I guess nothing good ever came easy. And, you know, you can think of all the cliches, no pain, no gain. You can think of all of them, but they're all actually true. Um, and I think St. Peter really addresses all of those in, in his epistle. So I encourage you to read it. It's a really easy read. Um, but um, yeah, that's that's all I have to share. I guess, do you have any questions or I don't know if Abuna is still on or if you have any comments um, to add, but um, that's that's all I wanted to share with you today. So glory be to God forever. Um, I don't know if Abuna is still there. I'm gonna stop recording. Abuna? That was a great talk.